Hi, my name's Nick Sharp, and this is my Moto Guzzi Cafe Racer that I built. Essentially, the bike is based loosely on a Mark II Le Mans engine from 1980, uh, frames from that period as well, but it's really a Bitsa built from various parts, eBay parts really, <laughs> uh, that I've restored over the years. So essentially the main engine, gearbox, wheels, front forks, they're essentially Mark II Le Mans from 1980, Moto Guzzi, uh, but with a lot of modified parts as well. What I thought we'd start with first is the front end of the bike. It had these new yokes engineered. One of the main things I didn't like about the original forks was the the, the yokes just don't look very nice and they're not made for modern components to be bolted too easily. So these yokes, they're not too expensive to have made up and while I did that I also had some nice headlamp brackets made up to suit the yokes. So the yokes are all custom made uh, and it makes a nice little feature of the bike I guess. It looks a bit more finished than just bolting on stuff to the original forks. You know? So you've got a little motor gadget, idiot lights here. We've got a GPS speedo, which means you don't have cables going everywhere. Nice modern LED headlight. But the actual forks are still standard Le Mans Mark II forks, just with uprated internals, um, but essentially the same. If you enjoy our videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, click the notifications bell and give the video a like. It's different when you get to the back of the bike because we're now starting to talk about more of the custom made stuff uh, that I've had done. Uh, there's a good friend of mine uh, down in Devon, a guy called DTR, uh, David, who makes all my aluminium components and the seat, which is, I think, one of the nicest bits of the bike, really. They also made the mudguard seat bracket. There's an air box under here, which we'll look at a bit later and the front mud guard so they're all handmade in aluminium which is really nice um, and they're all double skinned as well so it's not just what you can see on the outside the the double skin actually wraps under the seat and makes for a very solid good looking seat most of the other components they really come from a guy in germany uh, that i met a number of years ago, sadly not in business anymore, called Hartmut Taborski. He had a company called HT Moto. And he's the one who developed these exhaust pipes. These are 45 mil exhaust pipes. These are developed by him over many years. Um, his son used to win the Bear series in Germany and, and he developed the bikes for him. So I got a lot of tips and hints off of him about things, uh, how to modify the bike to make it run better, how to make it work better. And the exhaust system was really the, one of the biggest parts of that. It makes it sound good too. I wanted to keep this as a reliable bike uh, that I could just use any time I wanted to, but at the same time, uh, the standard Le Mans engine is relatively mildly tuned. So I was very lucky uh, to meet a guy called Amadeus. Uh, he used to run a company, or still does, called Raceco, and Raceco developed a series of camshafts for the Moto Guzzi engine. And I was very lucky to be able to get one of the last SS2 cams uh, for the engine. There's not a great deal of work done other than that really. Uh, it's been ported for, uh, in other words, the ports have been opened out slightly on the inlet. It's got this high lift, higher duration SS2 cam. All it really allows you to do on these older bikes, they, they don't rev much, to be honest. Um, the red line's around about seven and a half thousand and you very rarely get even up to that speed, but at least it's, it, it gives it a bit of extra pep. It's got a, a bit more torque mid-range, um, and on this particular bike, Raceco actually uh, rebuilt my gearbox for me as well. Um, it's still standard, but it's just nice to know that parts of the bike have been fettled by someone who is a, a good race mechanic.
the bike does perform moderately well, not, not by modern standards. Uh, the power of the bike is around about 65, 70 horsepower. So it's really not a lot at all compared to modern bikes. Uh, but when you take all the weight that I've taken off of the bike, along with the one or two improvements to the engine, there's a much bigger exhaust system. It's a 45 mil exhaust system on here, for example, uh, with the camshaft and the lightness of the bike compared to standard. I reckon it's around about 180, 185 kilos at the moment, which compared to standard is probably about 30 or 40 kilos under the standard weight for a Mark II Le Mans. Other than that, we're looking at a fairly standard bike, uh, the standard Le Mans wheels. Brake discs um, on both the front and the back of the bike are more modern stainless steel discs. But what you've got on the front of the bike, which I've modified, is a later four-pot Brembo caliper. So you've got some decent modern braking. The original single-pot calipers, they're okay. Um, but these stop you a little bit quicker, give you, give you a little bit more confidence uh, when you're riding. Underneath the bike, there's a custom wiring loom run by a Motor Gadget M unit. Uh, the M unit is a small box that allows the wiring to be much simpler. And also it's got built-in uh, digital relays in the Motor Gadget box as well. So there's no need for a separate box of relays or fuses. It's all taken care of by the, uh, the M unit. Similarly with the electrics, uh, there's no distributor uh, which would normally be sitting down in here. Um, that's all electronic. There's a German Saxi unit. Uh, the actual pickup is under this uh, front cover, the rotor cover. That's the pickup for the electronic ignition. And again, underneath the tank, you've got an electronic ignition module and it does make for very easy starting. Uh, and the bike has run faultlessly for the last three years that I've had it uh, had it made. Um, the only other thing from standard where you see there's a big gap here on a on a normal guzzi this would be covered with a side panel obviously for that kind of cafe racer look it's nice to have it a bit more open and so to enable that you've got to move all the electrics. All the electrics really sit either under the seat here or some are under the tank. The coils are under the tank, for example. So is the electronic ignition unit and the M unit sits under the seat. And the battery, if you can see it, is just in between the carburetors here. Now this is a, an anti-gravity lithium ion unit. Very small. Uh, it's no more than, I think about four inches by three inches. So it's a very small ultra lightweight battery. I built it three years ago. Like I said, it wasn't an original bike. It was built from parts only. I got this tank and the exhaust uh, and an engine block. And I thought I'd, I'd really like to make myself a nice bike. And so it's not really a, a chopped up old bike, if you like. I actually got the bike and made the bike that you see from just those components. It goes really well too. I've just come back last week from a track day at Brands Hatch. Had four or five sessions out on track. Absolutely faultless, handled like a dream. So for an old bike, it's, it's really good fun. One of the other key features that I wanted to do on the bike, which I'd seen on uh, classic race bikes in Europe, was to change the frame. Now, if any of you know the Le Mans frame, the original Guzzi frames, they're quite a heavy frame and they form a continuous loop around the bottom of the bike. Now, on the Moto Guzzi, that bottom loop, you can unbolt it. Uh, it comes as a separate part to the frame. Now, it's a bit of a race trick that they used to do, uh, like I said, from these, the bikes I've seen in Europe, where you take off this bottom frame loop, but then you need to replace it. So what they do to replace it is they make up a, a bracket, this chrome bracket you can see here. That, take, that picks up the rear mounting for the gearbox. And at the front of the bike, uh, the frame mounting is just in between the exhaust here. You shorten the frame, but what you have to do, the, the black part of the engine that you can see here, the timing cover, that timing cover comes from a later Moto Guzzi. Now, the later Moto Guzzi's they made, um, some of the frames were mounted like this, where the engines were mounted 
so the engine is hanging from the frame. So if you get the later Moto Guzzi timing cover, uh, you can still bolster these older round barrel engines and it allows you to have this engine mounting that, where the engine's hanging from the frame rather than being supported by the frame. And you also lose quite a bit of weight, I, I reckon around about 10 kilos uh, that you probably lose. So that's it. Okay, it's a road bike, but I wanted to have that little trick in there as a bit of a homage to the the, the old racers, if you like, because uh, it, it looks cool too. It allows you also to have the exhaust tucked in a little bit nearer to the engine, a little bit better ground clearance, things like that. This is another project I'm working on. This is from 1977, this one. This is a Sparta 1000. Same, essentially the same bike. The frame on this bike is exactly the same as the one outside, but this one's not been modified. So what we thought we'd show you is this one uh, in its original form um, as I'm building it. It will be slightly custom, this one, but essentially this layout is what my red bike is underneath. The main difference really, I was trying to explain outside, is this frame. This is the part of the frame, it just happens to be in silver here. I, I just decided to do it that way. Uh, and as you can see, it bolts onto the original frame, the black frame, here and at the front. And the modified bike outside has simply got a bracket that goes from here to the, the gearbox mount. So it has two bolts here and links up to the end. So that gets rid of this. And then at the front, instead of going to the bottom of the engine, like this one does, the different timing cover I showed you outside allows you, from a later Guzzi, allows you to bolt the frame, uh, bolt to the frame higher up on the engine, and so the frame essentially suspends the engine. On this one, the engine is supported from underneath. So that's the biggest difference. This is what my red bike looks like, uh, looked like originally uh, when I first got it. I'm just trying to show you a bit more detail about the uh, the different timing covers. Th this timing cover you can see bolts on to the front of the engine. It's really just to house the, uh, there's a timing chain inside here and it houses the rotor and charging mechanism for the bike. And as you can see on this one, the, the older bikes, the mounting for the engine is at the bottom of the engine. And that's why we've got this extension coming off of the, the frame. Now on my red bike outside, we've got a, a later timing cover and the mounting point is around about here. It's a slightly different casting. And that allows you to cut the frame at this point, weld a lug and attach the uh, frame mounting here rather than down. And it basically allows you to do away with all of this section of the frame, which on both sides adds up to quite a bit of weight and the centre stand as well. Um, and that's the main trick. That's the main reason for doing it is to try and lose a bit of weight. So we're just going to look at some of the uh, ergonomics of a cafe racer. <laughs> cafe racers, well, it, okay, I'll have to admit, much more of the design is about what they look like. I can't help that. Compared to the standard bike, this is very different. The main difference uh, why is your riding position. You're, you're going to be leaning forward. The main reason for that is this tank is about three or four inches longer than the standard tank. Uh, also, your seating position is pushed that much further back because of that. Uh, so on the standard Guzzi, the, uh, your seating position would be more here rather than here. So it may not seem a lot, but actually the weight difference on the bike and the way it handles is, makes quite a difference. The other thing, of course, compared to a standard bike is that your handlebars would probably be about four or five inches further up in the air than these are. And to be honest, even for clip-ons, these are fairly high. So these are Tomaselli adjustables um, that allow me to have a bit more height uh, and still have a clip-on. Uh, so when you sit on the bike, it's quite different again. The other is the ergonomic that makes it a bit different, of course, is the rear sets on the bike. Typically on a Moto Guzzi, your foot peg would actually be about four or five inches further forward. Again, along with the seat being uh, further forward on the original bike. All of these things are shifted back. Uh, but it does allow you for quite a comfortable position once you're actually on it. Now once you climb on, 
It's really not too bad. It actually, to me, it feels quite natural. Okay, you've got a bit of a stretch here, but look where your knee tucks in. It's really neat. It, it tucks in really neatly. Not much of a stretch, to be honest. And once you're underway, it actually feels quite comfortable. Um, okay, I've got other bikes with flat bars. Yep, they're always going to be more comfortable. But with this kind of riding position, you really do feel like it's a bit of a, an old classic race bike. It's got that you're leaning forward into the, the wind and it's really quite comfortable. Um, people have often talked to me about the seat. Yeah, OK, there's not much padding there. But, you know, once you're underway and you're actually riding the bike, I don't even think about that. It, it, it's not a touring bike. I'm not going to be doing hundreds of miles on it. Um, and I'll tell you what, for those Sunday blasts where you're going to do 60, 80 miles on a Sunday, it's more than adequate. It, it's really good fun. Um, if we just have a look at the controls while we're here, um, now because of the motor gadget unit we talked about under the seat, the motor gadget unit is all digital and that allows you to use what they call these momentary switches and they're literally just a push button switch, you push them once for them to work. Um, uh, these are from a company called Motone and they literally, I've just got a left and right hand indicator which I press once for on, once for off. Um, I've got a horn, start a button and high or low lights and that's all you need and they're like I said they're called momentary switches and that means that they just literally switch a relay in the M unit box under the seat and that makes that operation work. As you can see the main uh, display on the speedo is actually a rev counter. Much more important on these things to know what revs you're doing rather than the speed. It has got a speedo as well. This is the GPS speedo, and in fact, this is the uh, the pickup for the speedo, which unfortunately I didn't realise when I bought the bike. I thought GPS speedos were all built into a unit, but it's not. You do need to have a sensor, and unfortunately, that sensor has to be able to see the sky, so, so it has to be left exposed. Uh, the only other thing we've still got the old cable-operated clutch. Absolutely fine for a Guzzi. You can get hydraulic conversions for them, uh, but I've always found the cable to be absolutely fine. I've got a quick action Tomaselli twist grip, which means it's just about half a turn uh, to full throttle, which is always handy. And again, a much more up to date. Yes, these are actually Akasato um, uh, radial brakes, a bit over the top for an old Guzzi, okay, but. I just wanted it to be, at the time, I thought it was quite a neat unit um, and to be new. That's what I went for. It goes with the four pot calipers and believe me, the stopping power of this is almost on par with a modern bike. It's very, very good. If you've never owned an old bike like this, one of the first things I'd ask you to look at is the, the gap between the tyre and the bodywork on the bike. On a modern bike, you're used to seeing an enormous gap here. They have a, a huge range of suspension travel. Also, the rider, I think, is meant to perch higher up on the bike. In the 70s, the design ideas were all about the bike has to be low. Uh, so for that reason, there isn't a lot of, even though I've got a modern suspension unit on here, there isn't a lot of suspension travel, uh, probably less than an inch and a half, two inches of suspension travel. It's okay, but again, compared to modern bikes, this is very different on the road. It feels quite stiff compared to a modern bike. Uh, again, the, the front suspension is the uh, standard Madaguzzi forks, but I've got uprated springs in there. Uh, with standard dampers. So the front's not too bad. It is, it is good to live with for a, a road bike. One of the main things I've done though, which is different, uh, they do look a bit more modern, I guess, but it's the tires. Now these are from a company called Continental and they make a tire, and this, these ones are called Classic Attack. Now what a lot of people don't realise is that with 18 inch wheels like these are, for these old, nearly all the older bikes are 18 inch wheels, there isn't a huge range of tyres available. You can still get hold of 
uh, a good selection of tyres, but what you don't realise is that they are actually um, cross-ply tyres. They've got modern compounds in the tyres, but they're cross-ply tyres. Uh, these tyres are radials. There are very few manufacturers of radial 18-inch tyres that suit that are small enough for these rims. Uh, when I pull up at cafes I go to where there's a big selection of bikes, one of the things that most people comment about is how small the tyres are. Um, this is a 100 section front tyre and you've got a 120 section rear tyre. Now uh, I've got a modern BMW and the front tyre is bigger than my rear tyre on this bike. So the tyres are quite skinny and believe me if you're an owner of an older classic bike with 18 inch wheels, I know they might look modern, the tread pattern, but believe me, these tyres grip like you would not believe. Uh, the, the difference in handling and feel of these tyres compared to older cross-ply tyres is very different. The modern cross-ply tyres are very good. I mean, the, like I said, the modern compounds are very good, uh, but they're not a patch on these. These are radial tyres, modern radial tyres with a modern soft compound uh, made for these size wheels and it makes an enormous difference on the road and when I was at Brands Hatch last week believe me they stuck like glue they, they were really really good so if you've never tried a more modern tyre on your old classic bike give them a go but they're only available in a very narrow range of sizes One of the things that nearly always catches me out, this is the, probably the second, third bike I've, I've built, is about maintaining the finish because the problem is you build the bikes over such a period of time that maintaining the finishes on the bike as you go along can be quite difficult. Now what I mean by that is the, okay, you've got your frame powder coated, then you've got to get your engine into it without scratching it, and then you've got to put all the other components. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't got a lot of money. You might look at this bike and think, oh, it must be worth a fortune. Well, yeah, it may be it's worth a few bob, but I actually took about two to three years to put this together to be able to save up enough money each month to buy the components I needed for the next bit of the bit. And so the problem is, when you do the frame and the engine first, you've got to look after that for two or three years as you're building the bike up. So that's one of the trickiest things in building a bike, and unless you've got the money to do it quickly, is maintaining and, and choosing as well. So uh, choosing the types of finishes that are going to last. So for example, on the exhaust, okay, it's a bit more expensive than just hand painting it, but the exhaust is ceramic coated. Now this is after three years, it's lasted fairly well. And now I don't know whether it was a mistake on this one or whether I did the right thing on this particular build. The frame is actually painted, it's spray painted, not powder coated. And I deliberately did that because I thought after the first bike I built about 10 years ago, when you have a powder coated finish and you damage it, it's almost impossible to touch it up. When you've got a sprayed finish, at least you stand the chance of being able to mask it up and be able to respray an area if you get some damage uh, to be able to get the frame looking good again without taking the whole bike apart. So those are the kind of things that I did on the bike. Now again, I, some people agree, some people disagree with that. Uh, but like I said, it's three years. I don't use the bike every day. Um, it's lasted quite well so far. So uh, I think that was a reasonable choice to have. The other thing that you don't tend to do when you're planning a cafe racer is to plan it all in one go. I, I tend to build the bike as it goes. So that means that choosing components that match, that maybe have the same colour black. Believe it or not, there's lots of different blacks out there. So you try and find some levers. Well, do they match your switchgear black? Do they match the black on the end of your uh, mirrors? It's not going to be possible. If you're buying components from lots of different sources, like I've had to, it's very difficult to maintain the same finish uh, across the bike, which is, of course, what manufacturers are really good at. They uh, manufacture all of the components all at the same time, and so they get the colours exactly the same. So that's one of the most difficult things, is trying to 
match the finishes and colours on all the components. Now I tried to keep that down and tried to do it a bit better this time. You'll find the, if you have a look at the shots, the yokes, the speedo bracket, uh, there's a mud guard on the rear here. All of these components are out black anodized to try and make it so that it's a good lasting finish but I tried to make it so the bike would look like it was built all at the same time. So those are the kind of uh, issues that you, you can have. Other issues that I've maybe had in the build, um, not been too many to be fair because the idea of doing a cafe racer is that you're trying to simplify everything. So by simplifying everything means that you're taking away a lot of the complication of the original bike. The original bike's wiring loom was enormous, uh, totally unnecessary. Um, there's less than a third of the original wiring needed to run this bike now compared to the original loom. Uh, so you can lose a lot of junk. And that's why you don't need those big switches because the reason you've got all those big switches is because they do so many different functions which you just don't need on a cafe racer. All you need is a start button, uh, a high beam button and a horn. That's really all you need. Um, and to be honest, you can even get away without lights uh, and indicators if you really want. I've only really got indicators on these bar ends. Uh, there's no rear indicators at all. So that's a little run through of some of the, the, the issues that you have. Uh, the only other issue I can think of is in terms of older engines holding oil is always an issue. Guzzies are pretty good at that. They're not too bad. Oil leaks on older bikes are mainly because mating surfaces weren't prepared properly, gaskets weren't fitted properly. Um, the tolerances on older engines were very different to modern engines. On modern engines, not, you're not used to having really leaks at all. Um, but again, if you just pay attention to that as you build the engine, put the components together, it should be okay. And this bike's been pretty good so far. Now, if you're thinking about doing a build like this or any other custom bike, one of the main tips I'd, I'd give you, which is what I did early on uh, in this bike, spend a lot of time on the internet doing research. A lot of bikes might look very simple, but I can warn you now, the simpler a bike looks, the more work has gone into it to make it look like that. And it, to the untrained eye, it doesn't always seem, uh, who, or why should that be difficult? Well, when you're mixing original manufacturer's components, uh, which obviously I've got the frame, engine, gearbox, forks, etc. But then you're mixing on top of that a load of other components. You've got to be very careful that these parts work together. And that's not always the case. Um, I don't know, for example, you might buy some nice uh, clip-on bars, but they might be the wrong angle for your bike. You don't know until you've bought them and tried them. Um, I went through, before I was decided on this suspension setup, I thought, oh, I'll go for some upside-down forks, some modern forks. And yeah, I've seen Guzzi's fitted with modern upside-down forks, but do you know what? There's a lot of complication involved. Uh, the forks from a modern upside-down bike they're not designed to fit on these bikes, uh, they're very different. Um, and as soon as you've fitted those components, the brake components are different, uh, the yokes are different. There's a lot of things that you've got to modify and change uh, to get those components to all work together. So one of the main bits of advice I'd give you is do your research, do your homework. Look at other modified bikes and try and look at how they are different from standard. I spent a long time looking at Moda Guzzi Cafe Racers. There's lots out there. Study them. Uh, you'll get to know what they've changed, how they've changed it. Um, you won't always know because you can't always see underneath. Um, but at least on an open bike like this with no fairings, you should be able to see a lot of what's, what, what's been done. What type of footrests have they used? Where have they put them? what type of exhaust have they used. The same exhaust won't work with different types of rear sets. You've got to work out which rear sets are going to work for your bike. Handlebars, we've already mentioned those, about the front suspension. Are you really comfortable with a seat in position like this? Believe me, you wouldn't 
want to do more than about 60 or 80 miles on this bike before having a bit of a rest, you know? So do you really want to build yourself a cafe racer and go touring around Scotland? I don't think I would. Uh, so there's lots to think about. Um, and of course, the other one where we come to the end of it is the value. The value in this bike is just purely for me. The, I didn't build it to make a profit from selling the bike. I built the bike as a bike for me and I've built it in a way that I like. And that's the nice thing about building a custom bike, I guess. Don't think that you're gonna build a custom bike and make money. They very rarely sell for as much as they cost you to build them. Uh, I can tell you now that my, well, I won't tell you the exact amount, but the amount that this cost me to have, so just take one component, say so take these yokes, uh, a few hundred pounds to have made, then you have to pay shipping, then I have to pay for them to be finished, they have to be anodized, so that has to be shipped somewhere else to be anodized, come back. By the time you've done all that, with each component that you source, you can add up to quite a few hundred pounds that maybe you weren't expecting, maybe quite a few thousand pounds you weren't expecting. <laughs> Um, so that's the main advice I'd say do your homework do your research um, make a plan and stick to it one of the worst things you can do is change your mind halfway through stick to uh, one of the main things that sold me on this bike were I got hold of the exhaust which I really loved and the tank once I'd got those those were the key components of the bike I knew I wanted the bike to look like because I'd seen other bikes been made by uh, this friend of mine, uh, Hartmut, uh, in HT Moto in Germany. And I'd seen him make bikes with using this tank and these exhausts. And I knew that was the look I wanted. All the other parts are different from his bikes. Um, but that was, so that's one of the key things. Settle on some key components, get those, and then build the bike around those and make it look your own. So you'll see in the bike now, I've had the bike built and running for three years now. Initially it did appear at a couple of shows, it was at the Bike Shed show in 2017. And it's been featured in a couple of magazines, which I was really chuffed about. But do you know what? I built the bike to ride. It's very nice to have a little bit of attention, I guess, and have people admire your bike. But do you know, I built the bike for me, I, I built the bike for me to ride. and. Do you know what? Every single time I take this bike out, I have a big smile on my face. I really enjoy riding this bike. I've got modern bikes, but and I, I agree they perform much better in every respect. But I tell you what, when you get on an old bike like this and you ride it, it's so much more fun, so much more enjoyable. If you enjoy our videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, click the notifications bell and give the video a like. We value every one of our subscribers and your support really does help us make more videos. On the right hand side of the screen, you'll see more of our videos that we think you'll like. Thank you for supporting the Classic Motorcycle Channel.